praying and um, the Lord asked me a question when I was uh, uh, praying and it was uh, very strange what was happening, what I saw in a vision. Amen. So I saw a lot of Christians, not just only here, but all over the world, in different places with tears. People crying, you know. And I said, Lord, what is this? And they said, people are losing their hope because of the difficulties they are passing through. That they are becoming hopeless because of the attack of the enemy and they are giving up. And the enemy knows that anytime we are hopeless in any situation, then we become helpless. And because I want to show you this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are in the evening over there, that any situation that becomes hopeless in your life will become helpless. And that is what the devil always wants us to do, to make us think that that situation is hopeless. And the Lord spoke to me that a lot of people that have committed suicide, the first thing that happened in their life was that they look at the whole situation and the situation is hopeless and they thought there is no other way and the only option is for them to take their lives. That that is a trick of the enemy. In these days, going after Christians, in making, frustrating them so that they become hopeless because he knows that any time you are hopeless, you are faith with that. And without faith, you cannot receive from God. So I'm here to let you know that whatever situation you are passing through, God knows. Amen? Because God sees you wherever you are. And he knows that situation. You know, it was shocking to me because I took this message yesterday in a Bible study. And at the end of teaching, a lot of people came to me. And one woman asked me, you read people's mind. I said, what do you mean? He said, this is the situation I'm passing through at home with my, wife, with my daughter. I said, no, I don't read people's mind. Holy Ghost knows what they are passing through. And he revealed to me what uh, I was teaching. A lot of families, the same young people, they came and they said, this is exactly what has happened to us. We have given up our hope because of the situation we are passing through. We don't want to tell anybody. So wherever you are today, no matter what you are passing through, I want to let you know that God knows. Because that was exactly what happened. At the end of the teaching yesterday, their faith rose up. They understood that there is no way you can be in God and become hopeless. The unbeliever, they can become hopeless because they have no God. But as a believer, there is nothing you will do that God is not interested in. You can't be hopeless. Your situation can't be hopeless because God is interested in you. Amen. So I want us to go to the book of Psalm 42 this morning to see where David became hopeless. But David recognized that he shouldn't be hopeless. And he spoke to himself. Psalm 42 from verse 5 to 6. Hallelujah. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the head of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the he Mizra. You see, David was hopeless here. And he saw, because that is what normally happens, that any time the situation becomes so tough and we become hopeless, our mind is seized. It's like our mind is not working any longer. We don't want to hear anything from anybody any longer. That was what happened to David. But David said, he, so he spoke to himself and said, my soul, why are thou cast down? You know whom you believe. You know that there is a God. And he said, when I remember you in Jordan, what does it mean in that place? You see, Jordan is a place where God performed miracles. Jordan is a place where God divided the race, uh, divided Jordan and allowed the children of Israel to cross into their promised land. And most of the times, we forget what God has done for us before. I'm here to let you know that the only way, one of the systems or one of the principles or one of the ways of overcoming hopelessness is for you to remember that the same God that helped you before is still the same God. He doesn't change. The enemy might lie to you, but the word of God said God doesn't change. 
Because God doesn't change. If he did it for me before, he can do it for me again. All I need to do is to remember him and start to praise him. If I can thank God for what he did for me yesterday, he will, that will cause God to do more for me today. But what does the enemy always want us to do? He always wants us to concentrate on what is happening right now. Not to remember what God did for us before. But David said, when I remember you in Jordan, I will still praise you. And that is what I'm here to let you know. That no matter what the situation may look like today, God doesn't change. God is interested in your situation. Because he's interested in your situation. It's time now for you to let the enemy know that you are not going to give up. But you are going to praise God. And the same God that helped you in that situation before is ready to help you again. Amen. You know, there are some situations that we come into our life like this and we don't know what to do. We don't know where the help is coming from. And the only thing our mind will tell us, it is enough. I cannot take this anymore. It doesn't matter who you are. I will show you a man in the word of God today that he has performed a, a notable miracle. That is why you don't depend on the gift of yesterday. You see, you see God is a God of now. After Elijah had performed a notable miracle in Israel, Elijah came to a situation whereby he became hopeless. So it doesn't matter who you are. You might be thinking your situation is, is different. No. You might be thinking, oh, you are nobody. No, you are somebody in God. Elijah was a man of God, a great man of God. But he came to that situation whereby the situation looked hopeless. Everybody get to that place, even myself. Nobody is a giant. The only thing is that you remember in the word of God, because that is what the word of God says in Romans 15 verse 4, that the word of God is written for us to see what happened that we can learn as an example. Let's go to the book of First King and see what Elijah did. First King chapter 19 verse 1 to 4. First King 19 1 to 4. And I have told Je Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with her, how he had slain all the prophets with his sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And when he saw that, when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. And left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. You see what I mean? It doesn't matter who you are, it's only God that cannot come to a hopeless situation. As far as you live in this world, but as far as you live in this world, there will be a time in your life you will come to a situation that will look hopeless. But what do you do? Because look at what Elijah, Elijah did. After Elijah has slain the whole prophets of Baal, he called on fire from heaven and fire consumed the sacrifice. He saw the hands of God. And when you look at it in this place, I ask myself this question this week as I was studying this. How come that Elijah was able to slay more than 40 prophets of Baal, or more than 400 prophets of Baal? One man. He slayed him. He killed him. And now a woman, one woman, sent a message to him. And that message brought him to a hopeless situation whereby he ran away and said, God, kill me. And God answered him. He said, son, you know what? That Elijah, by the time Elijah called on the fire, by the time Elijah killed the prophets, Elijah was operating in faith. Because there is no way one man would just kill 400 prophets by himself. No, it's not possible. It would take God to do that. See, Elijah was operating in faith. But when Elijah left faith, and start to operate in the flesh. Fear came. Because the Bible said, when he saw, when that messenger came and spoke to him, he had, my question to you, what are you seeing today? Or what are you hearing today? 
Because most of the things we see takes our faith away from God. Most of the things we hear takes our faith away from God. I call that circumstances. Most of the time our circumstances is what speaks to us that makes our situation to become hopeless. But I come here to let you know that if you will listen to me because we find out that when Elijah ran away after he heard from Jezebel, but the moment Elijah heard from God, Elijah's faith came back. And that is why the enemy most of the time, that when we are in that hopeless situation, the first thing the devil will tell us to do, throw away your Bible. Don't listen to anybody. Don't listen to God. Don't go to church again. Don't pray again. What is he trying to do? He's trying to take you away from where you will hear from God. Because he knows that the moment you hear from God, that situation that looks hopeless will arise. Hope will come into that situation. But what does he do? Many of us, when we come to that situation, he will tell us, don't go to church again. Church becomes your problem. Christians become your problem. You don't want to fellowship with anybody. These are all tricks of the devil. He will say, don't read the Bible. He will ask you the words you've been reading before, what did he bring into your life? He will ask this question, all the obedience you have been obeying God for so much, what did you gain from that? But all those things is just devil's trick to trick us away from the word of God so that we can focus on the circumstance he's using to let us know that that situation is hopeless. Let's go back to the same chapter, verse 12 to 13, and see what happened to Elijah. Verse 12 to 13. First King 19. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah had it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him, and said, What dwell thou here, Elijah? You know, that place, when I got to this place, I laughed. I said, Lord, why are you asking him this question? You know why he's here. And the Lord spoke to me and said, yes, I know why he's there. But he's supposed to know better. He's supposed to know that I am God. He's supposed to know that the situation that he's facing is not bigger than him. It's not bigger than him because I am with him. The same thing God is telling you, what are you doing in the place where you are today? Crying over that situation, thinking that there is no solution. God is asking you today, what are are you doing there? That place does not belong to you. That hopeless place is not your place. You got to hope in God. That is your place. There is no man, there is no woman that is born again that know the truth that we know and that know that know that know that there is no situation on earth here that is bigger than God. In short, I'm here to let you know that the moment you are born again, you are redeemed from every hopelessness. Amen. So all those things the devil is telling you that it's not possible, it is just a lie. The devil is a liar, and that is what he speaks to us. And most of the time we buy those lies, and we look at our situation and say, okay, there is no way help is going to come. Who told you that? The Bible says the earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, and all that are on earth here, they belong to God. If you start to operate in faith today, God will send help. I mean it with all my heart. God will send help. You never know where God is making people to think about you or to talk about you. I have an experience recently, and that's why I tell you, don't depend on your geographical environment on that. Depend on God. God owns the earth. I had some visitors from, from the United States, and they, they, they told me, they said, we have been watching your program in YouTube, and now we just come to see you. And we, we, we thank God for what God is doing. We want to let you know that we are ready to support in what you are doing in this island, because we see that the hands of God is upon me. And when they left, I said, God, I didn't even notice me say yes. That is what it is when you start to operate in faith. I will start to let my people know who you are. It doesn't because I know them. I know this is the heart of all kings. They are in his hand. I want you to rise up this morning or this evening, wherever you are listening, or in the afternoon, wherever you are listening. Rise up and put back your hope in God. Because the moment you put back your hope in God, your faith will rise up. When Elijah heard the voice of God, Elijah stood up. He wrapped himself with his mantle. Faith came back. Amen. And so as believers, we don't look at our situation from natural viewpoint. Otherwise, the devil will use that situation and drive us into a despair where we don't see the use of even serving God. I mean it. 
They have seen people in this situation. They don't want to serve God any longer. I remember one of our friends, uh, my friend and Pastor Manor's friend, they call him, Brother Frank, in Europe, over in Europe. He got to a situation. I believe God that God is with that man today because I'm really praying for him. Without him, I wouldn't be where I am today. But what happened? He got to a situation one time that his situation became hopeless. And one day, I came to him and I said, Brother Frank, you know, I brought my Bible. He looked at me. He said, if you are going to talk about God, stop it. I was shocked. He said, we can be friends and talk about any other thing, but if it's about God, stop it. I don't want to hear anything about God. And I looked at him and I said, I have nothing to talk with you rather than God because I know this is the devil. What happened to that young man? His situation became hopeless. And that's what the devil does. He used his circumstances to tell him that there is no way. So don't look at your situation from natural view. Because if you start to look at it from natural, devil, that is his home base in the natural. Natural ways is his ways, the things of the flesh. And anytime we dwell in the natural, he will defeat us. That is why the Bible said, the judge shall live by faith. We don't live by what we see. We live by what the word of God says. Amen. If you start to live by what you see today, you will end up in despair. You will end up being disappointed. Because what we are seeing in the world today is terrible. And we are going to see more terrible things today. That's what the Bible says. Things are not going to get better in the world. But in the kingdom of God, things will get better because we don't live by according to the standard of this world. We live by faith. There is no crisis in heaven today. And when you live by faith, you live by the standard of heaven. Faith that is in, that is in you is also in heaven. That is what the word of God said. Jesus said, we are not of this world. But we live in this world, but we are not of this world. Let me give you an example. I had this from, 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 from uh, uh, Pastor B. Wilson. He said he went to Haiti. Haiti is just very close to this island. He went to Haiti. And when he got to Haiti, in those days, far back, he went there. And when he got there, the poverty that is in that place is terrible. He's still like that today. Amen. He said, but as they were walking on the street, he got to the center of the city, and he saw a very big mansion, white wall, and the green grass there was very alive. And he asked the people that were living, who live in this mansion, in this in the midst of this poverty. And they said, that is the embassy of America. The ambassador lived there. He said, the moment they said it, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you see, though the American ambassador lives in Haiti where poverty is killing people, but yet that poverty is not touching him because he's an ambassador of America. He's living the standard of America in Haiti. The same in the Bible says we are ambassador of Christ. So if there is crisis in the world, we should not look at the crisis, but we should look unto the heel where our head coming from. And as we start to look unto the that will be where our hope is. Because let me tell you something. At times some people try to operate faith without hope. It doesn't work. The Bible said faith is the evidence of things. The evidence of things not seen. The things we hope for. So if you don't have hope, there is no way your faith is going to work. So the moment the enemy snare your hope, that you don't see the future any longer, your faith can work. And that is his trait. You are an ambassador here. You don't look at the things you see, but you look at what the word of God says because that is the standard. You are, and you are not supposed to be living. Let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 verse 16. Hallelujah. Romans 1, 16. The Bible says here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and to also to the Greek. For therein is the graciousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see, I, I, I gave them this example yesterday in, in, in our Bible study that at times when you tell people to live by faith and hope in God, it is not very easy in the world where we are. But you got to take it according to the word of God. 
Because the people around you, as you start to believe the word of God and start to speak it, they will look at you and say, but look at their situation. That is what the, uh, uh, Paul is saying here. Say, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of saying what the gospel says concerning me. I might not have money for cash in my pocket, but that doesn't mean I'm poor. You know why? God supplied my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Recently, God taught me something, and I'm going to teach you that this morning. To let you know that you are not poor. You see, before we left Holland and came to Curacao, that very day, before we left, God asked me to do something that I didn't know that he was going to use that to teach me yeah, after five years. And you, you can see it here, many of you learn on the video, you can see this yellow paper. This yellow paper was in this Bible five years ago. The Lord asked me, said, get this yellow paper and put it on your Bible and calculate your last salary. I calculated that. He said, calculate your wife's last salary. I calculated it. And the Lord said, write down the date. You can see it here. January 2007. I put it right here. That was when we left Holland. And the Lord said, I am going to give you what you are having here. Hundredfold. I said, hundredfold. You want to let me know that you are going to pay us this hundredfold. He said, yes. So I left it here. I want to show you that you are not poor. The devil might be telling you you are poor, but you are not poor. It's only you accepting that. So, after about three weeks ago, we're having seven days fasting in the, in the church. And this Bible is uh, Brother Copeland uh, study Bible. I have one of them, a lot of them different times. But I was reading for some time now Brother Morris uh, for your Bible. So, I, I kept this one in the, in the wardrobe where my books are. So, in my prayer room at the back there, the Lord said, you remember what I asked you to write down some time ago. I said, what was that? He said, five years ago. I said, five years? Where is it? It's in your Bible. So I started to look at my Bible, to look for it in my Bible, but I couldn't find it. He said, not in this Bible. I was just in the prayer, but the Lord has to stop me and start to ask me this question. He said, go into your house and pick up uh, Kenneth Copeland's study Bible and check inside, you will see it there. So I went inside, took my Bible from Kenneth Copeland, and I saw this book, I said, wow! I wrote this thing now since five years ago. The Lord said yes. And I wanted to take another paper. So I took this white paper. He said, I want you to calculate. Now, to let you know what you have in me because you don't know it. Because if you know it, you will not be looking at your circumstances. That is what is happening to many of us. Many of us don't know the investment we have made in the kingdom of God, but God is keeping that investment for you. So you might not have one cent in your pocket, but you are very rich. And until you start to act by faith, those things are not going to be released for you because it's only faith that pleases God. But how can you act in faith if you're not aware of what you know or what you have? So this was what happened. The Lord said, okay, from the date you wrote down this, calculate it until you are 65, if you are to continue with this job. Calculate your wife's salary also if she was to continue with this job until she was 65. And I did that. He said, how much is it? And I told him. He said, times it by 100. I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, yeah, assuming you, you continue to do this job, when I call you to move, you resign because you're supposed to do the job until you are retired. But you sold all this into my kingdom. And didn't I say in my word that those who left their home those who left their life with his job, I will reward them hundredfold. This is what you have sown in the kingdom. And I'm able, this is, he said, this is what you have in your account in heaven. I say, what Lord? He said, yes, you don't know, but I know. I say, I keep record of everything. I am not a man, I can't lie. So you sold your life. Your wife sold her life into my kingdom. You left the job you are doing, the job that was bringing food into your, into your uh, home. You left it for the sake of the gospel. And you sold it into the kingdom. I will reward you hundredfold of what you sold. Say, this is what you have. And he's told me this. He said, look, for example, when you have a savings account in a bank, you don't go one day and withdraw the whole money. No. You go when you are in need. He said the same thing. He said, any time you are in need, your account is overflowing in heaven. Go to that place and withdraw. Man, I woke up. 
I, I stood up from the, my, my prayer room. I walked into the main house. I woke my wife. I said, look at what is happening. Look at what I'm hearing from the Lord. Two of us started to rejoice and started to praise God. Two days after that, I was reading a book from the Hill He said the same thing. After three days, I finished that book and I was reading a book from the Hill He said the same thing. I said, oh, this is why these men are like this. David you know, said, he said, look, that account in heaven is real. The reason many Christians are suffering is that they are looking at the account on earth here, whereas they have sown. You have sown seed. You have given up time. You have left your home for the sake of the gospel. All these things are making your account in heaven to overflow. And it's time you stop looking on what you are seeing on earth because you are very rich in God. And when you release your hope in God and your faith will rise up, what will happen is this, your faith will start to bring down those things from your heavenly account into your natural account. Amen? A hopeless situation is a helpless situation. That is the trick of the devil. He knows that he can use what you are seeing to attack your mind and you will look at that situation and say there is no way you cannot get any help. Why? I explained here. He so said there is nothing God, no man can do for anybody who sees no hope in a situation. Why? Because when hope is dead, faith is helpless. Amen? Faith becomes important in hopeless situations. And without faith, God cannot help you. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. So when you are no longer hoping for breakthrough, faith is dead. The moment you don't hope for breakthrough, your faith cannot work. Because faith is the energy or I can call it the, 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 the power that brings to pass what you hope for. That thing you desire in the future. Faith is the one that brings it. But for example, if you have no hope, what is faith going to bring? Nothing. And that is why the enemy tried to make our situation hopeless. That we don't have any focus any longer. We don't look see the future. The Bible says that for the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the pain. I want to advise you today. Don't allow the pain you are passing through to take your faith away from you. Abraham endured the pain. Look at Abraham. Abraham was working all the time. His faith was working. And Buddha here that Abraham's faith was working all the time. Because in all the situations that look hopeless, he continued to hope. And faith was able to deliver what he hoped for. Hope and faith are like wife and husband. Let me explain this. Faith doesn't work by himself. Hope cannot also work by himself. You see, when a man and a wife, when they get married, they hope to have children. Why? Because this is a woman with an egg in her ovary. That egg is a hope that one day that egg will grow up to become a baby. But that egg cannot grow by itself. The hope is that as far as you are a woman, because I'm not talking about men, two men get married, I don't care how, what their hope or faith is, they can never give birth. No matter what uh, uh, people are saying, it's still possible. But as far as it's a woman, they have the hope that one day the baby will come. But that baby doesn't just come. We tell the husband fertilizing the egg. So I put it this way that the hope is the woman with the egg. And the faith is the man with the spermatozoa that we go and fertilize that egg. And then what will happen? A baby which is their desire will come. The same thing. The moment you have hope is alive. Your faith will say, okay, what is that thing you are hoping? What did the word of God say about it? Bam! I believe it. I speak it. I start to meditate on him. I start to speak him. The angel will start to operate now because they grow in strength at his word. Why are you speaking those words? Well, the word of God is creating. That thing you are hoping for, which is the image. If I'm hoping to get this, I have this as an image my, in my mind. And I will go, my faith will go into the word of God. I will go to the word of God to know what the word of God says about this God. What do I do? I think that what they call the word of God is faith. Faith coming by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. The moment I take the word of God, this image is my book and I start to speak it. I start to speak it. Before you know it, one day I will come across it physically and it come to be. See, my desire is fulfilled. That's how faith and hope works. 
But whereby I don't see anything, no matter what I speak, it's not going to come to pass. That was what happened to Abraham. Abraham, has, his situation was hopeless. He was a man of 100 years old. And yet God said, you are going to have a child. Have you, you know, at times we read the Bible, but we don't think about it. Just in your neighborhood, we think about a man of 100 years old. How is it possible that he can have a child with a woman of 90 years old? Such situation look hopeless if you are in this situation, if you look at it naturally. But Abraham was not looking at it naturally. Abraham took it by faith. Said, God said it, that one day Isaac will come. Therefore, I am not going to look at my body. My body, I don't care what you do. I don't care how you look like. I am going to believe the word of God and look at what the Bible said Abraham did. Let's go to the book of Romans. Hallelujah. Romans. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. See how Abraham dealt with a situation that could have looked hopeless in his life. So that you can do the same thing. Amen. Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed. Even God, who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, and that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall I say be. The Bible said, against hope. Which means his situation looked hopeless, naturally. The same thing, that situation in your life might look hopeless. That sickness might look as if there is no cure for it. The doctors may say there is no cure, but the Bible says by the stripe of Jesus you have been healed. So you don't look at it from a natural view. You look at it by what God said. God did not say these are the diseases I will heal. He said all diseases. Or you might be looking, oh my account is red. I cannot pay my mortgage now. I cannot pay for my car. God said, I am the God that supplies your needs according to his riches in glory. So what do you do? You don't complain, so oh, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? You just say, Lord, I thank you for your supply all my needs according to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. When you start to live by faith, you will see that the word of God works. It happened to me last two weeks. God woke me and said, start to live by Let your faith increase. And I start to speak. God supply my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The Lord supply my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What happened? Money came. I don't even know where it came, but God brought it. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go further and see what Abraham did. And be not weak in faith. Amen? He considered not his own body now dead, which he was about a hundred years old. Now that he had the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strong in faith, giving glory to God. You see, Abraham staggered not. Abraham looked at himself, the body said, Hey, old man, you are weak. How are you going to pregnant Sarah? Sarah is old. Sarah has passed menopause. But Abraham said, It doesn't matter. Whether Sarah has passed menopause, I am still going to believe what God says. Amen? Say, I am still going to believe what God says. I don't care whether Sarah has passed the age. I'm going to believe God. And Abraham believed God. Amen. Abraham believed God. He continued to believe. He continued to speak. Amen. Let's go further. He said, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord. You see, Abraham did not look at his body. He staggered up at the promises of God. He said, though I am weak, though my body is old, though my wife is old, but God gave us a promise, and I'm not going to give up on this promise. I'm going to thank God. I'm going to praise him. In the midst of situations that look hopeless, I am going to thank God because God is able to perform what he says. The same way you should be acting. You should be looking at your situation and saying, it doesn't matter what is happening around me. God said it, and God is able to perform what he said. Therefore, I am going to praise him. Amen? Our hope in God, in difficult times, pleases God. When we hope in him and fear him, not the circumstances, and keep obeying him, despite all the noise of the devils around us, it gives us entrance into his mess. Excuse me.
You see, our hope in God pleases God in difficult times. I told you, I said, God, we know whether you trust Him or you trust your, the arm of flesh in difficult times. Because this is what many Christians do. A lot of them do that. And we are ready to obey God when everything goes well. But when things go up, tough, we fear the circumstance. We fear the voice we are hearing. And then we put God aside. And we say, okay, I will continue to obey when things get better. You know, that's a trick of the devil. But God will test you and see whether you hope him, whether you trust him when difficulty is coming. Who will you put first? I told you yesterday of how we had some financial problem about six years ago in Holland. And uh, because of some business venture I went into and it didn't work. So we had some, some, some debt in Kyoto. And uh, we, we, I, I spoke to my wife and said, look, this situation is like this, but we are not going to disobey God in our tithing and in our giving. I said, the first thing you are going to do, my salary comes into my account, and, you, and your salary costs me only 20 feet. But our mortgage is on the first of every month. But the first thing I want you to do is I want the salary to come as you are coming back, stop by the bank, because it comes through the city. Stop by the bank and collect our tithe. So we are not going to take God last because of our situation. And we are going to obey God. And when he, we did that for about two months, I mean, it, during those times, the bank would come because we could not pay the complete mortgage. They would call. And I would tell them, yeah, we will we, we pay it. Why did I have that hope? Because I obeyed God. You see, I knew that God is not going to disappoint me in difficult time. Because I obeyed him in difficult time. And what happened? Our, uh, uh, our tax return that was supposed to come back, come maybe in two months, uh, uh, we were spending it in two months. All of a sudden, we received a letter so quick that we had more than enough to pay off the mortgage that we were behind and pay off the debt we were, we were having. And had more than enough to go on holiday. Amen? More than enough to go on holiday. Why? Because we obeyed God. God showed us that, look, if you put me first before anybody, before, before your mortgage, because he said, I am number one. Whether in difficult time or no difficult time, I remain number one. But what does many Christians do? We only obey God when things are right. And that stops us from entering into his mercy. Let's see that. The book of Psalm, Psalm 33. The mercy of God, the door to his mercy is open mostly to people that Take God serious. You know, there are different mercies. I told someone say, there is mercy for everyone. But there is also grace for people who obey God. That's what Paul said. There is a grace, general grace. Everybody can be saved. But grace have left. There is a special grace for people who don't play with God. Who said, no matter what happens, God is number one in my life. Psalm 33, verse 18. Amen? Hallelujah. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. See, to keep them alive in famine. In what is famine? Difficult time. The hope is in God, not in what they see. Let's go forward. Our soul waited for the Lord. He is our help and our share. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Let what? His mercy. Because we hope in him. Because we fear him. What is it to fear God? You see, at times we don't understand what it is to fear God. Fearing God does not mean hiding or all, walking. We, I see you, I'm humble. No, that is not fearing God. Fearing God is fearing His word. Whether in difficult time, in time of famine, in time of plenty, He said, no, my God is number one. Because of that attitude, the mess of God will be open to you. Mercy is bigger than 
justice, even when you are not right with him, but because you decided in your heart that God is number one for me. God is number one. That door of mercy to get you out of that situation will be open unto you. And when that door is open, smile will come. Smile will come. And I told my wife, I said, I thank God for the door. I see God open our life. But I also know with all my heart that that is because of his grace that he has given unto us to obey him in all things. And when it's difficult, we say yes, Lord. When we are tired, we say yes, Lord. When we look, cannot even help ourselves, we say yes, Lord. And the same thing that we advise you that is listening. Don't put God aside because of difficulties. Because God demands for us that he be number one in our life. And when we put him number one, whether in difficult time or not in difficult time, God will see us through. Amen? God will see us through. Let's go for that. The devil may use your situation to lie to you and cause you to lose hope, thinking that there is no way. But the word of God made it clear that as far as you are born of God and connected to him, there is no hopelessness in any situation because God is able. Let me explain this to you. You see, at times we forget about what the word of God says. The Bible says this, that if a man be in Christ, all things are passing away. Behold, all things become new, and all things are of God. My question to you today is this. You are born of God. You are no more living by yourself. You live by faith in Christ Jesus. Everything concerning you is of God. Can you see God today and see the hopeless situation in God? No. Can you look at Jesus today and see a hopeless situation in him? No. If you cannot find it in God, there is no need to ask you. You're supposed not to find it in your life. You're supposed not to accept it from the devil. You're supposed to tell the devil, look, I have been redeemed from hopelessness. So all you are saying is a lie. There is no hopelessness in my life any longer because I am in God and there is no hopelessness in God. I am connected to the living God because I'm connected to him. There is no hopelessness any longer. Any situation you throw at me and want me to think is hopeless is just an opportunity for me to get into another level. I am not going to accept it. I am going to praise God who is able to deliver me from this situation and promote me in your presence because God said, in the presence of your enemy, I will anoint your head. Let's see that. Go to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, to show you that as far as you are born again, child of God, you have been redeemed from hopelessness. There is no hopelessness in a child of God. So every situation that look hopeless right now in your life, I just want you to start to praise God and start to thank Him because now you are getting revelation that that situation is not hopeless. But the devil is lying to you. Anytime the devil tells you it's hopeless, know that there is hope because he is a liar. Turn his word opposite and don't accept what he's saying. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 4. I read, For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. Hallelujah. For him that is joined to the living, there is hope. Are you joined to the living today? Yes, you are joined to God. He's the living God. The only one living God. And because you are joined to the living, there is hope. I love that scripture. To him that is joined to the living, there is hope. I am joined to the living. So no matter what the devil put for me, I will praise God. And because I know, the Bible says that we you know Hosea chapter 4, they see that my people they perish because of lack of knowledge. The reason you see Christians coming suicide is because of lack of knowledge. God is in you. God is interested in your situation. You are a child of God. I asked people in our church yesterday, I said, look, if God can save you when you don't know him, why do you think he cannot help you when you are in his household? Why do you think? If he can give you his best, his best was Jesus. His best is still Jesus. And he gave it to you and me when we didn't know him. Then now that we are his own children, why do you think that that situation he can solve? What he has already given to you is far bigger than
than that situation. Because people, many of us, we don't understand what salvation is. If you cannot praise God for any other thing, you can praise Him today for your salvation. I hope to them, I said, until you die, and your eye will see hell, you will know what God has done for you through the blood of Jesus. You will see people you know in the place. And yet they say, God, and you love me and redeem me from here. For that alone, I will praise you. The Lord spoke to me about it. I said, Look, I love people who praise me because of who I am, who love me, not because of what they are going to get from me. He said, People who praise me because of what they are going to get from me, I don't trust them because when I don't give them, they will praise me. But those who love me, they praise me. Whether I give them or not, they still praise me. And those are the people I bless abundantly because they love me. Can you imagine that? So turn around today. Don't praise God because of what you get from him, but praise him because you love him. Keep your hope on fire in him because you know that he will not fail. He's not a man that he should lie. How does hope come? The source of hope. Hope comes from the word of God. You see, that is the trick of the enemy. Let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4 to see where the hope of Abraham, where it was coming from. Romans 4, 17 and 18. Hope comes from the word of God. The same way faith comes by hearing. Amen. Romans 4, 17 and 18. As it is written, period. As it is written. This was what Abraham was looking at. Let me go forward. I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believe, even God who quickened the dead and called those things who be not as though they were. Who against what believed in hope? Why did he believe in hope? Because he found out that God said it. He found out that it, it is already written. And whatever is written is settled in heaven. God cannot lie. That's what Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says. God that cannot lie. In the book of Numbers 23 verse 19, it says he is not a man that he should lie. But the son of man should he promise and not fulfill it? No, he cannot. In Psalm 89 verse 34, he said, I will not break my covenant. No altar that that is gone out of my lips. Abraham found out that it is written. He found out that God said it. The same way, if you want hope, you have hope to remain alive. Don't allow the devil to lie to you to throw away your Bible when you are in difficulty. Because that is his truth. He doesn't want you to see that there are situations, there are situations in the Bible that faces you, that face people also, and God delivers them. He doesn't want you to see that. I told you yesterday. You see, at times people say God created them. God never fail anybody and God will not fail anybody. Let me give you an example. You see, Shebra, Meshach, and Abednego, when they the fire, when the king asked them to bow down and they refused. They said, we are not going to bow down, king. We don't care what we do. If they were looking at the fire, they would have bowed down. Uh -huh. And they would have bowed down and they would have said, God fail us. We believe God. And we say we continue to confess God. And now God doesn't want to say, well, look at the fire. Okay, let's bow. They would have gone there defeated. But they said, King, we are not going to bow down. If our God is unable to say, well, we are not going to bow down. And what happened? When they went into that fire, not looking at what they are seeing, they were acting by faith. When they went into that fire, God entered into that fire from them and delivered them. The same people, they were not the only Jews there. They were other Jews in the land of Babylon. But those Jews, they thought that God had failed them, they bowed them. They said, God, why did you bring us here? But these three men, they said, we are not going to bow them. We don't care the fire. They entered into the fire. What happened? God entered into that fire with them. And God glorifies them. At times, many of us, because of our situation, we look at our situation. The devil is bringing against us. We are looking at the, how tough it is. And we say, oh, God, have failed me. No. God said, even when you pass through that situation, I will be with you. All you got to do is look at the situation and say, look, I don't care who you are. I don't care whether the devil is the one standing before me. I am going to praise God because I know that my God is able to do it. When you start to live by ladder, I, I close with this. The thing that helps me and my wife is this. And I want to give you that advice. In the time of your trouble, start to do double of what you used to do for God. That's what we do. If we were giving our, if we were giving ten percent or twenty percent of our finance out to people, when the enemy attack our finance, we we'll double it because we know that God is busy with us. God wants to bring something to us, and the devil wants to steal it away from us. If any way he attacks you, in any area he attacks you, 
He attacks you in your prayer life. Make up your mind. Say, okay, now I'm going to fast. Oh, the Satan, watch me. I'm going to fast. If you are disturbing me, not allowing me to pray, I am going to add fasting into my prayer now, and I'm going to win on the law. Any area he attacks you, the only way to get it out of frustrating is double what you are doing. When you double it, you frustrate him. And you enter into your next level. Wherever you are looking at what he is doing, and think that God is not there, he will defeat you with what you are seeing. Don't walk by what you are seeing, but walk by what the word of God says. Amen? Walk by what the word of God says. Many of you that are online right now, I can see some of you. May God bless you richly. Some of you I cannot see because of your computer system. Amen? But we'll be closing right now. And I want to advise you with this. Today, make up your mind. Amen? Make up your mind that whatever God says is the answer. Whatever God says is the solution. Not what you see. Amen? Not what you see. Whatever God says is what I'm going to do. My situation is not going to speak to me. But what God says. And my hope is not going to fail because I am not living in the area of hopelessness any longer. Amen? I am no longer hopeless. Because I've been redeemed from hopelessness. The Bible said in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 4, anyone that is joined to the living will no longer be hopeless. All things that are in your life today is of God, and God doesn't have hopelessness. Therefore, look unto the heat where your head coming from. I want you to leave this place. That situation that looks hopeless, start to speak to that situation. Jesus said in Mark 11, 23, whosoever shall say unto this man, speak to that situation, praise God, and say, God, I thank you for leading me from hopelessness. I don't see hopelessness, but I see breakthrough. And then your faith will start to rise up. Go back to the word of God. Build your faith and watch out for what God will do. Amen. God bless you abundantly. Remember one thing, that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is coming. Find a church that teaches the truth and go. Amen. It's only those that know the truth in this last day that can survive the arrows of the enemy. That's what I tell you everywhere I go. Don't just join a religious church that will make you give up in little bit. If you are going to watch, if you are watching this video live right now in Fusion World or right from your computer, or you are going to watch it later, if, or you come across it in, uh, in YouTube or Twitter or in Google, I want to pray with you if you don't know Jesus. Remember that we can win the whole world. We can get all the money in the world, but without Jesus, at the end of life, it is a waste. Therefore, I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I declare with my mouth, because I believe in my heart that you are Lord. I ask you to be Lord over my life. I give you my life today. And I thank you for cleansing me of all unrighteousness. I receive your righteousness. And I receive your blood that makes me whole. Thank you, Jesus. I declare you are my Lord today. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you are praying this prayer, look for a church. A Bible-believing church. And start to attend. If you want to contact me, you can contact me with our email address. GHP Jerusalem at home. Amen. Contact me. Or you can contact me through Facebook. And we will see how we can help you. We are helping a lot of people in different places on how to know God. And we can help you in whichever area that you need to help. May God bless you. See you the same time on Sunday, on, on, on Friday. I will be dealing with a very sensitive and very glorious topic on, on Friday. So I want you to join me at the same time on Sunday. Amen. God bless you.